Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mark McClish, and I'm here uh, speaking to you on something that's important to me. Uh, I'm a graduate of uh, Freed Hardman University. I graduated in uh, December 2018 uh, from Freed Hardman's art program. Uh, I have my degree in art. Uh, you can't see it, but it's over on the wall, right there. Um, that, my focus is on graphic design. I currently work as a graphic designer. I uh, met my wife at Freed. Uh, we got married while we were still enrolled there. Um, I actually started majoring off in chemistry. Um, and don't get me wrong, I love chemistry. Um, but that's clearly not the, uh, the talent that God gave me. It's clearly not the gift that I needed to pursue. Make a plan and watch God laugh, right? The time that I spent in the Freed Hardman art program was um, incredibly beneficial for my walk and development as an artist, uh, more so than any other time in my life. Um, it was the first time in my life that I realized that art was a viable pursuit for me. I've always been an artist, always been doodling, uh, drawing on the backs of tests and quizzes and whatnot, drawing in class. Um, but before, the, before I came to Frida, I never thought that I'd actually be able to do anything with it. Um, the greatest benefit for me, of course, was to be able to study my talent, my art, in a loving Christian environment, and that's exactly what Frida Hardman provided for me. Lately I've been hearing and seeing a lot of harsh allegations against the uh, Fried Hardeman Art Department, um, alongside a lot of misinformation and a lot of misconceptions. And I, I hope that uh, anyone out there who is uh, following the situation is also doing their research, checking both sides, uh, checking for logical fallacies in the arguments on both sides uh, so that you can make a fair and level-headed decision on where you stand. And I also hope that my experience and my testimonial will improve the situation. And I have been praying and am continuing to pray to God that uh, what I have to say will be pleasing to Him. Now I want to make clear um, that I'm in no way currently affiliated with Fried Hardman University. Uh, I don't represent them. I don't represent their values, I don't uh, speak for them, and I don't speak for anyone working there, for any other individual, I just speak for myself. Um, also, although I will be making uh, specific references uh, to certain people and paraphrasing certain people, uh, specifically Caleb Robertson, uh, the videos that he posted, uh, this video is not intended for any specific person or any individual audience. It is. Uh, intended for anyone who is aware of the situation, and um, I hope that this video can serve to lovingly provide information, facts, uh, a different perspective uh, to those who are watching the situation unfold, and uh, to defend a group of people in an institution that have earned my support and my respect. Now speaking of Caleb Robertson, I want everybody watching this video to hear this from my mouth. Uh, there is a lot of good coming from Caleb Robertson. Um, he's not our enemy. He's our brother. And our fellow Christian, he is fighting against the status quo, against what is comfortable, against what we are used to, and that's not easy at all. Um, he's fighting for what he believes is right. It's hard to fight for what you believe is right. Um, when a lot of people disagree with you. And if you've been watching his videos, uh, if you watched his second video about Fried Hardman that he posted recently, he's getting into jail ministry. So that's really good. Jail ministry is, uh, is great. Um, my mother-in-law currently works in jail ministry. Um, every Saturday, she is, she's a very godly woman, uh, excellent role model, true foot soldier of God. And by her example, she issues the same call to action that Caleb has given in his video to be active. It's a message that every Christian needs to hear. 
uh, to do more than just attend church every Sunday and maybe Wednesday night, uh, to go out into your community and to work, to bring God to people. I believe that Mr. Robertson has good intentions in his fight and uh, in the allegations he brings up against Fried Hardman, and he brings up some excellent points for our consideration. And these are points that we as Christians should be educated on and should consider critically. And any opportunity, an excuse to study the Bible, right? We should always be like the Bereans in Acts 17 and search the scriptures daily to find the truth. And I want to humbly consider and study these points with you. So the allegation against Fried Hardman is in two parts. Uh, the first part is the art department at Fried Hardman University is requiring its students to study and view pieces with nudity in them, which is equated to a pornography. Okay, so uh, the first thing we have to do with that is to define our terms. So we have to define what pornography actually is. Now, uh, from the Oxford Dictionary, definition that I have and the one that I would operate within, uh, is a material complaint con material containing the explicit description or display of sexual organs or activity intended to stimulate erotic rather than aesthetic or emotional feelings. So pay attention to that phrase. Intent to arouse, especially intended to stimulate erotic as opposed to aesthetic or emotional feelings. Now, if you're following that reasoning, pornography is defined by its intent, and that's the intent of the artist who made it. Uh, we're specifically referring to visual art in this case, so I'm going to use terms accordingly. Now, of course, there is a factor of innocence involved. Um, some material is so graphic or lewd that it could not possibly be depicted without being pornographic, uh, regardless of the intent of the artist. Uh, the artist would have to know better. Uh, for example, Right there in the definition, um, display of sexual organs or activity, I do not believe that the actual act of uh, sexual intercourse could possibly be made, could be made into art without the intent to arouse, but someone making art of that kind of material would have to know what kind of effect that their art is going to have on that, on their, um, on their viewers. They know what that subject material would do. There's no escaping it. So the question becomes where do you draw the line? Uh, what is the threshold when it comes to the subject matter of art? Uh, what can be innocent, what can't? And I've already given you an example of what I think can't. Um, this is a question of something being intrinsically sin versus extrinsically sin. And what I mean by that is um, so take something that's intrinsically sinful. Something that's intrinsically sinful is going to be a sin no matter what. You can't escape the sinful nature of that thing, like stealing or lying or murdering. It's no matter what. It doesn't matter what the context is. It doesn't matter who the person is, what's going on in their heart. All that matters is they have committed a sin. <laughs> the sinful nature of that thing is inherent. No ifs, ands, or buts. Now, on the other hand, something that is extrinsically sinful is relative. It's sinful by function, so to speak. It's something that is sinful to you, but not to someone else. And in the, war the world of fornication is rife with this uh, technicality, and we're going to go to the Bible here in just a minute about that uh, distinction. There are plenty of things that may cause uh, lust or impure thoughts to one person, but not to another. Um, so which is nudity? Is nudity intrinsically sinful or extrinsically sinful? That's a question we have to ask first. Um, before you answer to yourself, I want you to realize if nudity is intrinsically sinful, then there is no justification for it. It doesn't matter um, if you're in a medical context or not. Um, if you believe that nudity is intrinsically sinful, then it's sinful no matter what. There is no justification for it, there is no excuse, there is no reason that makes it okay. Um, it's wrong in the eyes of God, and as you know, the wages of sin is death. It's Romans 6 verse 23, but I, 
I don't think that anybody is going to be making that argument that nudity is intrinsically sinful. It's the context that makes all the difference. Uh, we all understand that nudity can be extrinsically sinful uh, based upon when it happens. Lust is a sin, immodesty is a sin, uh, the context is significant uh, based upon uh, the act. So, we have to ask ourselves, is art an appropriate context? Well, that's debatable. Uh, I do not believe that nudity and art is the same thing as pornography. Um, not that statement by itself. Uh, nudity and art is not the same thing as pornography, and yeah, I know that Hugh Hefner made the same statement, but that doesn't discount the stance. Uh, associating that statement with Hugh Hefner is what's known as a guilt by association fallacy. Uh, it's an illegitimate argument, a logical fallacy, in which a stance is associated with a disliked figure, uh, such as Hugh Hefner, and therefore discounted. It would be like saying, oh, well, you made this argument, and also this horrible person made that argument. That means it's a bad argument. Logical fallacy. And I think for someone to claim that Hugh Hefner was not intending to arouse the people who read his magazine uh, is ridiculous and dishonest. So let's start with the viewing viewing of nudity in art. It's the first allegation. Uh, I do not believe that it is a sin to view nude art, uh, assuming that the art is not made to be arousing. Uh, of course, we can only speculate as to the full intent of, say, Renaissance painters. But consider how the world views classical art like this. They, they don't see it as sexual. Uh, this kind of art is stored in museums. It's stored in quiet, reverent places. Uh, the world doesn't consider this art to be arousing on a large. Of course, there's exceptions to that. Now, I do believe that it is a sin to lust over new art. I do believe that it is sinful to um, look at that material and have lust in your heart. And that's when it becomes a problem. For some people, those two are inseparable. They can't have one without the other. Some people cannot compartmentalize their impure thoughts and uh, nudity, even in an innocent context. Uh, for those people, nudity is extrinsically sin. It is sinful by function. So let's take a look at uh, Romans 14, starting in verse 13, where the Apostle Paul is writing about this distinction that I'm talking about. He says, Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide to never put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. Now, that's a reference to intrinsic sin. Right now, they're talking about animals, animals which have been established to not be unclean anymore. Uh, so, so eating animals are not intrinsically sinful verse continues, uh, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it is unclean. Now that's extrinsic sin. For some people, this action, this technically innocent action, is sinful because they believe it to be. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. And if you are not familiar with the entire chapter there, uh, I encourage you to read on for yourself. It's extremely relevant to what we're talking about. Uh, nude art is not a sin for me. Um, it doesn't cause me to sin. It doesn't give me any impure thoughts. Um, I've been seeing these classical Renaissance paintings long before I ever went to college. Uh, they're just out there in the world. They're hard to avoid. But it's not a problem for me. Uh, but for some people, it is. Uh, there's plenty of material in the world that offends some people and not others that is not inherently sinful, uh, such as the unclean, that are clean, animals. Uh, those people who are offended, I take from this passage, uh, those brethren who are weaker in the faith, as they are described in the first verse of that chapter, uh, should be welcomed. Uh, they should avoid the things that cause them to stumble, and we, as their brothers and sisters, should help them to avoid those stumbling blocks. Uh, we should remove the stumbling block 
from them as often as we can, remove them from situations that might tempt them, and yes, that absolutely could apply to an art class. Certainly not just an art class, the devil has hidden temptations everywhere, and I genuinely believe that you could find objectionable content in almost any class. I mean, they're, everybody's tempted by different things. It doesn't matter what uh, class you're in, there's potentially tempting content in any subject of study. Um, but here's what you do when you are faced with temptation, when you're faced with something that is a stumbling block for you. Take a look at Matthew 18, verse 7 uh, and following. Woe to the world for temptations to sin. For it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. And then the verse goes on about uh, Jesus is describing, and then if your hand or foot or eye causes you to sin, remove them and throw them away, for it is better to be crippled than lost. Now, take a look at the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, and we'll take a look at verse 27 through 29. Jesus is talking about adultery again, and it's the same thing. You've heard that you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. The burden of action is on you. If you're tempted, if there is danger of you committing sin in your heart, committing lust in your heart in this case, you have to do something about it. Avoid the sin at all costs. Uh, pluck out your own eye if you have to. Uh, don't let anyone stop you from avoiding that thing, whatever it is. But at Fried Hardman University, including the art department, no one is going to stop you. No one's going to force that upon you. I, uh, I actually have the, the textbook in question here with me, Gardner's Art Through the Ages. Um, I have to say, um, I went to the website, uh, fhunudeart.com, um, and I, as a side note, I do not recommend that you go to that website if you are offended by nudity, if nudity is a problem for you. Do not go there, because there's a lot of nudity on that website. Um, but I don't have a problem with it, so I went, and um, on the PDF of the uh, incriminating images, so to speak, um, the first one is the worst one, for the shock value, I'd assume. Um, but that first image, I've never seen it before in my life. Um, I mean, I studied this book with extreme depth. When I took modern art history, um, that was a really difficult class. We, we had quizzes uh, every week. Um, they were extremely in-depth and they were extremely easy to fail. And so we had to study it in great depth. We had to study the assigned reading. But that particular image, that first image that everyone is so shocked over, I've never seen it before. We never studied it. I don't remember much nudity at all in that class. I just remember struggling and <laughs> trying to remember a thousand details about every tiny little thing. Uh, we were focused on learning the history. But here's what I do remember. First day of class, the teacher, who I'm not going to name, but she's an incredibly intelligent and skilled woman, and I was blessed to be able to learn from her. Uh, she, she tells us on the first day of class, if any of us are offended by the subject matter, we're not going to be forced to look at it. Uh, we're not required to view it. We were allowed to sit outside the class. We didn't have to attend that day. She warned us ahead of time. Uh, or we could come into class and we could close our eyes. Uh, no one was forced to view anything. Um, it was more of a this is a class on art history, and this is the material that is in the history of art. If, you, if it causes you to sin, that you don't have to look at it. Um, maybe you believe that nudity is unacceptable in art. Maybe you think that it is uh, morally wrong. 
no matter what, uh, even in art. Um, and if that's what you believe, I respect that stance. And I don't think you'll find anybody at Freed who doesn't respect that stance for yourself. And nobody is going to force you to uh, look at anything that bothers you like that. Uh, when the FHU Uncovered allegations rose up a couple years ago, uh, I, was, uh, I was in the class at the time. Uh, and when that happened, we were reminded of our ability to opt out. Uh, in fact, I think if you check out the documentation on the FHU Uncovered website, um, they even have it recorded there that the same offer was extended to the student in question. She was warned quite accurately uh, that nudity in art is inescapable. Uh, outside of the Fried Hardeman Art Department, out in the world, uh, if you are an artist, that's just something that you are likely to encounter from time to time. And if nudity is a stumbling block for you, I wouldn't recommend art as a career path for you. I mean, a, a parallel would be um, if, if vulgarity, profanity, swearing is a stumbling block for you, I wouldn't recommend uh, construction for you. It's not necessarily that you're going to be doing it yourself, and in the art world it's not necessarily that you're even going to encounter nearly as much, but it's there. And choosing any particular vocation is going to put you in a position to potentially be tempted. That's just the way of a fallen world. Now as for creating nude art, that's the second allegation, that Fried Hardman University is encouraging its students to create nude art. The closest that we ever got to something like that was in Drawing 2, when we were learning figure drawing. Um, any artist needs to have a basic anatomical understanding of the human body for the sake of proportions. Uh, I'm a graphic designer, so I mostly design like uh, logos and flyers and websites and that kind of thing, so drawing human beings doesn't come up very often, but it does come up, and without learning the musculature, of the human body, I wouldn't be able to do it. Um, and I had to practice. I had to practice a lot. I had to draw the muscles and the hands and the legs and the arms, hands especially hard, over and over and over again to get that practice in, to get that experience just to figure out how to do it properly. Um, Oh, the closest we ever got to uh, using a live or human model was uh, using a black and white 3D computer rendering of the human torso, uh, again, to study the musculature of the trunk, which, again, was made clear that it wasn't required if it offended our conscience. No teacher in the art department would ever deliberately expose you to material that would be a stumbling block to you. They are all good Christian people, brilliant individuals, and uh, I am privileged to have been able to study my talent, the talent that God gave me, uh, under their tutelage. They're not teaching or promoting anything bad. You know what I saw the most nudity in my time at Fried Hardman University? It was in the dorm room. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, uh, students at Fried Hardman University uh, have a roommate, so I had a roommate. And uh, I, like many other people, also had uh, sweet mates. So I had two other guys with whom uh, my roommate and I shared a bathroom with, and I saw a lot of them, got very familiar with them. Um, for me, that's not a problem. But for others, I'm sure it's a significant stumbling block uh, for people who struggle with homosexuality. But the dormitories operate under the assumption that for most people, statistically, do not struggle with that. For them, it's not a problem. So the nudity that they're exposed to every day over the four years or so of living in the dorms is acceptable. It's the same way with any school that doesn't have private rooms, and the assumption, the same assumption is true for this textbook. It's assumed that most people aren't going to have a problem with it. I don't know why they changed the textbook, if they did. Um, this one is fine, it's a good academic resource, um, that's why I kept it, uh, but if they did, I would guess that it was in the spirit of diplomacy, not because they're trying to be sneaky or dishonest, um, 
maybe it was a simple update to the curriculum and the timing was just coincidental. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the position that Fried Hardman University is in. Um, I've heard Fried Hardman described recently as a Bible college, and I just wanted to clear that up. Uh, Fried Hardman is not a Bible college. Uh, it's a liberal arts university with a Bible program. Uh, I think they actually started out as a business college, but now they're a liberal arts university, uh, which means they focus on undergraduate education, uh, and they focus on the science and liberal arts, which include literature, philosophy, math, arts, humanities, etc., as opposed to a technical school. Now, some of you know uh, Fried Hardman uh, attained its university status somewhat recently. Uh, there are still some relics scattered around that say Fried Hardman College or FHC on them. Um, but it's my understanding that due to this university status, and don't quote me on this because I'm not completely sure. There are plenty of people who you could ask who are more familiar with the situation than I am. Uh, but the point that I'm getting to is that this this book, this textbook, as incriminating as some people believe it to be, uh, a textbook like this is inescapable. Uh, Fried Hardman has to have a certain kind of textbook. Um, they have to fulfill certain standards that are set by the secular academic community in order to be recognized. If they didn't have a, a textbook from a certain list, I would not have a degree in art that was recognized by the academic community at large. Uh, so it's not as if they can just pick and choose a textbook that they think is the best that has no objectionable content in it. What they can do is to not study the content that is objectionable. And that's exactly what they do. They censor out the stuff that they think is going to be a problem without permanently modifying books, of course. Another note I'd like to make about my experience at Fried Hardman University is that I never once heard uh, anyone say anything along the lines of that Fried Hardman is setting the standard for Christian schools or that they were the best or most conservative Christian university. I heard that plenty before I started school there, you know, people talking about how, oh, Fried Hardeman, of all the Christian schools, it's the most conservative. I heard plenty of people say that, but once I got in, um, I don't get that impression. Um, I don't think that anybody in administration or faculty sees it as a competition. Um, they're simply trying to provide a quality education in a good Christian environment and uh, set a good example. They're not trying to compete or be the best. They're simply trying to serve God and promote a Christian atmosphere, promote an academic environment in which people can worship God as well an academic environment in which God is the priority. And they do a great job of that. You know, I never thought that I would be saying this because uh, you know, I used to have such a low opinion of Freed. When I first went there, I didn't actually like the school at all. I, I just went because they offered me a generous scholarship and, you know, my, my parents went there, so it was easy. But those misgivings that I had against the school were just founded in ignorance and misconceptions and misaligned priorities. When I started at Freed, I was angry. Angry at all the injustice in the world, all the hypocrisy and the apathy. And I felt the need to take out that disappointment on the world. I was very disillusioned with Christianity. You know, we hold Christians to a higher standard, and so it... It hurts worse to see them uh, make mistakes, do things wrong, we expect more from them. But I didn't have a Christian attitude. Really, even though I was baptized, I didn't really understand what it meant to be a Christian when I started at Freed. I didn't have the, the peace which passes understanding that we hear described in Philippians 4 verse 7. The world has a lot of problems. Christians have a lot of problems. It's hard walking around in this fallen world 
trying to find your way, uh, deny yourself, have less of you and more of God. And a hard lesson that I've had to learn is this. You are never going to get it completely right. No matter how smart you think you are, no matter how smart I think I am, no matter how much you study and think and meditate, you won't ever fully grasp the fullness of God. You'll never be an authority on God's word. Uh, you, all you can do is your best to study and obey what's uh, recorded in the Holy Bible. You will be wrong. You will get it wrong. You will mess up. And there you will meet people who know more than you do about something or have considered something in the way that you never considered. And that is sobering. Sobering and it's important to humbly admit the limits of human comprehension. But there will come a time when you believe that your brother or your sister or your neighbor is living in sin and out of love, you feel the obligation to correct them. That's what we're called to do. So to wrap up this video, let me share with you the gentle nature of correction that I'm still learning from the role models that I met at Freed. And I'm addressing both sides of the fight here. Uh, whether you're standing against or for Freed in this controversy, consider yourself and consider your opponent and how you feel about your opponent. Well, we take a look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 23. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies, knowing that they only breed quarrels, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, and correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil. A change in heart comes from God, not from us. There's limit to our power and influence. Uh, but, but pay attention to the qualities that are listed here. Uh, kindness, ability to teach or edify, patience, enduring, and gentle. Now let's swing over to the fruits of the Spirit real quick in Galatians 5, and they are love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, patience, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So we've got overlap with four of the five from our passage in 2 Timothy. Arguing or debating is not a sin, but there is a specific way that we're supposed to go about it, and kicking and screaming is not that way. Remember that human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. That's James 1 verse 20. And also bear in mind Proverbs 6 uh, verse 16 through 19, where we're hearing about the six things that the Lord hates, uh, the last few of which are a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brethren. In Proverbs 15 verse 8 uh, is one of many similar statements about a hot-tempered man who stirs up strife, uh, contrasted with one who is slow to anger, who quiets contention. The Bible is full of verses like this about um, trying to avoid conflict. Uh, obviously, Christians are expected to be a peaceful, people. Now Jesus gives us a very specific protocol for resolving conflict. You know what it is, and it's in Matthew 18, a little later in the chapter than when we visited it before. And again, I recommend you read the entire chapter for your own edification. Uh, but I'm just going to read to you verses 15 through 17. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you who if he listens to you, you've gained a brother. But if he does not, take one or two others with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And then, if he refuses to listen to even the church, withdraw fellowship. Paraphrasing. 
Now, this passage speaks of an individual sinning against you personally. You talk to them first, uh, and if they don't listen, bring another Christian or two to back you up. If they still don't listen, um, you have an intervention with the whole church. Uh, interventions, if you've never been involved in one, are always supposed to be held in a loving context, uh, gently trying to help the person in question get their life on track. Emphasis on gently. This passage does not say that you should publicly humiliate your brother or sister in Christ. There's no justification for that. It doesn't say that you should make a nasty video shaming them and encouraging others to do so as well. And if you truly, deeply have a grievance against someone, and you have, you have gone to them and talked to them one-on-one, -on -one, heart to heart, and then you have gone to them with your brothers and sisters, trying to help this person, talking to them, saying, look, here's a problem, we need to fix this. They still don't listen. And then you have talked to them with your church family. If after that they still don't listen, Withdraw fellowship. Don't bother them. Don't talk to them. Don't continue to deride them or try and humiliate them for attention. No matter who they are or what they're doing, there's a point at which you have to let go and move on. Regardless of what others are doing, don't perpetuate a quarrel. I want to read to you one of the Beatitudes to sum up the picture of what the Christian manner should look like because I think it's easy to forget that sometimes. Um, there are scores of verses that you can read for yourself about being kind, gentle, slow to anger, uh, slow to a quarrel, patient, loving. But what I want to look at is Matthew 5, verse 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Do you know what meek means? It's easy to forget sometimes, but meek is an extremely important attribute for a Christian. Meek is a combination of all of these traits that I've been describing to you. Um, meek means soft, gentle, humble, mild-mannered. Um, a Christian should not be showy. Uh, they shouldn't have a lot of bravado, be loud, crave attention. These are not the traits or the behavior that we should be uh, celebrating or tolerating. Of all the good things that we are called to do, the greatest work in the world, we don't need praise or attention for it. If you think that you're doing good work, if you think that you are doing the Lord's work and you are proud of yourself, good. Be proud of yourself. Be proud of the Lord's work. Keep it to yourself. Don't shout it from the street corners. Hide it in your innermost room. Don't let one hand know what the other is doing. And the Lord God who sees in secret will reward you. Matthew 6 verse 4. It's easy to be angry and hot-headed in, uh, in the good fight. Uh, it's so satisfying. And you feel righteous fighting for what you believe in. Fighting for what's important. It's in my nature to fight. Um, it's so natural for me to be a pugnacious, aggressive, assertive. But aren't we called to deny ourselves in favor of what God asks us to be in Matthew 16? Meekness is counterintuitive for some people, and it's certainly counterintuitive for uh, the American culture. And I know it is for me. But it's one of the best things that a Christian can be. Uh, we have to remember our place. Remember how humble we ought to be before each other and before God. And I find it helps to have role models to look to, to have uh, physical examples that we can look to to see of uh, what kind of personality that we need to have. Um, there are public figures uh, in the world that sort of uh, embody this attitude of meekness, such as Mr. Rogers, uh, Bob Ross, and Steve Irwin, very quiet, gentle individuals. Um, also, I have always enjoyed hearing the 
current president of Fried Harman University speak because of the quiet and gentle manner in which he speaks. And, and that goes for uh, quite a few of the teachers there as well, especially in the Bible department, uh, they, the way that they talk so peacefully. It's inspiring. I also benefit uh, from the influence of people close to me that show me the meekness that I aspire to. Uh, my mother-in-law, I made reference to earlier, is a hard worker, tireless in the Lord's work. But she never uses her work ethic to raise herself up or to tear others down. The few times that she has felt the need to rebuke me, she has always made sure to be gentle and to ensure that I knew that her words came from love. And I did know. My wife, who is uncommonly patient, extremely slow to anger, has had more influence on me personally than any other individual uh, in making me more calm and loving. And my best friend, who is also my best man, with his example, he continues to aspire me every day to be a Christian man more like he is. His kindness, his gentleness, and his optimism, they seem to be infectious, and I honestly hope that they are. I could list many more people in my life, and none of the people that I could list or I have listed uh, would want this attention that I'm giving them here. Uh, they, they don't want this praise, and they don't need it. I see the love of God in these people that I am blessed to have in my life. And most of these people I met in college. If you're a parent watching this and your child is considering attending Free Hardman University, there are few better decisions they could make in their life. There's, there's few better paths that they could follow for the sake of their spiritual health. Before I went to Free Hardman, I was an angry, cynical, bitter young man. Uh, I didn't have any direction in life, didn't know who or what I wanted to be, didn't know what it was important to me. My faith certainly wasn't strong and it wasn't my own. Um, but in those years at Fried Hardeman I found peace. I learned the value of kindness. I'm not going to credit a single individual with that change, although many individuals influenced me and helped me because I know that it was God that made that change in me. It was the atmosphere of loving God that exists at Freed Hardman. I found love at Freed, not just for my wife, but for my friends, for other people, for my neighbor, and for the Lord. And I hope everyone can find that same love. Freed Hardman isn't perfect. But there are a lot of good, strong Christians there, and that's what makes it great.